This island was the gateway to America for all steerage class passengers. Only the poorest tasted America first in these concrete detaining halls, but they had a dream that no adversity could shatter until America turned her eyes inward. The 1920s reflected paradox. On the one hand, easy tolerance of flappers and jazz. On the other hand, intolerance and distrust of foreigners. The nation of immigrants had closed its door with strict anti-immigration laws, but it would be increasingly difficult to shut out the rest of the world. <laughs> immigrants of early 20th century America filled the cities with a vigorous labor force. Polyglot tenements were overrun by eager workers, anxious and exploitable. The prosperity of the country had been achieved in large part by their labors. Then strangely they became pariahs in their new land. Well, there were both the fear, which has been a chronic fear, that is a limited number of jobs and immigrants coming competing for this limited number of economic opportunities. And there was a feeling that America ought to be essentially a, a North European Protestant country. That that's what it had been, that's what had made it great. And therefore, bringing in South European, East European, non-whites from Asia and Africa and so on, represented some another destabilizing influence. The Ku Klux Klan had originated in the South in the wake of the Civil War. It was always an anti-black movement, but in the 1920s it had a new mission. Professor Robin Winks of Yale. In some ways it was a new organization simply using the old name. And the new Ku Klux Klan was at least as concerned with what they viewed as Bolshevism, with anti-Semitism, they believed that many of the Jewish immigrants were communists, and with opposition to the new Southeastern European immigration. They were also, of course, very anti-Catholic. In 1925, the Klan flaunted its power by staging a march down Pennsylvania Avenue in the nation's capital. That year, its membership had reached five million. It's generally agreed by historians that the 1920s represented the height of American racism. Is the period in which segregation laws were developed to their most ludicrous in the South. The laws that we associate with making blacks enter different doors of public libraries are all the products of the 1920s. It was a period of time in which the Oriental American was sharply restricted, of course, a period of time in which we were giving virtually no thought to the rights of what today we would think of as uh, Chicano Americans or Indian Americans. Americans on the whole were fearful that their cherished institutions would be undermined if they had undue contact with the outside world. With the passage of a single law in 1924, America shut out the rest of the world. The cares of the world seem far away. 
January of 1923, French troops marched into Germany's industrial mecca, the Ruhr Basin, because Germany was delinquent in her reparations payments from World War I. Germany had been paying in timber and coal the colossal debt of $33 billion. One of the reasons for the French takeover was an American demand for payment of war debts from the French. Professor George Kennan. I think one of our greatest mistakes was uh, to insist all through the 1920s and the early 30s on trying to collect the war debts from our ex-allies because this gave them not only an excuse but almost a valid reason for continuing on their part to try to collect reparations from Germany. And this was psychologically unfortunate and um, was one of the causes, I think, of the success of the Nazis in the beginning of the 30s. Fear of Germany propelled French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand into virtually continuous treaty negotiations. He desperately shuttled around Europe seeking allies against a resurgent militaristic Germany. From Antwerp to Prague, from Belgrade to Warsaw, and finally in Locarno, he completed his ring of paper treaties. Behind this intricate system of alliances and calmed by a temporary economic stability in Europe, France began to reflect the prosperity of the 1920s. Hey, la fête. De tout petit poton, Valentine, Valentine, et la fête, un tout petit piton. For all the world, and particularly Americans, Paris became the symbol of naughty gaiety. Un tout petit menton, Valentine, Valentine, outre ses petits potons, son petit piton, son petit menton, et l'été frisé comme un mouton. words of Gertrude Stein, Paris was where the 20th century was. Ernest Hemingway agreed. So did F. Scott Fitzgerald, who became the spokesman for the lost generation. The disillusionment following World War I had created a cynical generation of intellectuals who found, in the words of F. Scott Fitzgerald, all gods dead, all wars fought, all faiths in man shaken. Yet coupled with the literary cynicism of the 20s was a boundless popular idealism and the belief that world peace could be achieved by making war illegal. It was a naive concept brought about by public opinion rallied by the American peace movement. In the early 1920s, the American peace movement became more aggressive. It had splintered into several groups, the most vocal branching off from the women's suffrage movement. After World War I, the American peace movement became very active, of course, because so many people had been horrified by the destructiveness of the war itself. It also received a number of new allies because the women had achieved their primary victory in receiving the vote, and many of them now began to crusade for peace as well. I labored 40 years to secure the vote for the women of this and other nations. Suffragette leader Carrie Chapman Catt became a fighting pacifist. I've put 10 years behind me already. That is a work for peace. It surely is the greatest question of the next 50 years. Professor Nicholas Murray Butler, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, led the battle to outlaw war. His colleague at Columbia University, Professor James Shotwell, suggested to Briand that he sign a treaty with the United States to renounce war. Briand sent an open letter to American newspapers appealing to the American people for a bilateral treaty to outlaw war. Secretary of State Frank Kellogg was angry that Briand went over his head to the American public. Secretary of State Frank B. Kellogg was noted for his irascibility and explosive temper. One of the odd quirks of his life was that while he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he despised pacifists and dismissed the peace movement with a barrage of profanity. The peace movement was a highly visible minority in mid-20s America, 
primarily because of all the attention it got in the nation's press, the principal manufacturer of public opinion. Again, Professor Wicks. Public opinion is always very important in any democracy, of course. And the question is, how is public opinion made felt upon the formulators of foreign policy? The 1920s is still a period when newspapers dominated the formulation or the expression of opinion. It was a period of time in which everyone believed what they read in the newspaper. They believed what they read in their history books. They tended to believe what they were told. And naturally, many people told them what they wanted to hear. The men who controlled the written word in America were press lords like Joseph Pulitzer, who believed in strong editorials and vigorous crusades. Newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst became one of the most powerful men in America. A strong nationalist and isolationist, he revolutionized journalism. He appealed to a mass audience with bold headlines, lots of pictures, and the gee whiz approach to the news. The most opinionated and conservative of the press lords was Colonel Robert McCormick of the Chicago Tribune. Both McCormick and Hearst favored tough immigration laws and both opposed entangling foreign alliances. Calvin Coolidge, newly elected president, shared the general view of McCormick and Hearst on America's position in foreign affairs. His inaugural speech reflected his hands-off attitude. American isolation was deepening. I believe in the American Constitution. I am opposed to aggressive war. I shall avoid involving ourselves in the political controversies of Europe, but I shall do what I can to encourage American citizens and resources to assist in restoring Europe with the sympathetic support of our government. President Coolidge relegated foreign policy to a minor role. His main interest was American business, and his friends Henry Ford and Thomas Edison appreciated that approach. The president's most memorable remark, the business of America's business, was music to their ears. And in 1927, business was very good. Professor John Morton Blum of Yale. During the 1920s, the American people, it seems to me, experienced an extraordinary rise in their materialistic expectations. A lot of this, I think, had to do with the first flowering of American advertising, with all of its obvious tricks, its devices for associating um, material goods uh, with the kinds of things people have always wanted, uh, food, comfort, status, sex. Uh, thus, the Buick at the country club, thus the Lincoln with the handsome blonde entering its front door. to the good life was a strident call of the peace movement. For 70-year-old Frank Kellogg, it was a bothersome din. Kellogg was a self-made man who never attended grade school, high school, or college, but educated himself as a law clerk in rural Minnesota. He became a corporate lawyer and a U.S. senator. As Secretary of State, a colleague described him as workmanlike but unimpressive. Kellogg was so pressed by the cry for peace, he was obliged to take a direction in foreign affairs that he found distasteful. There's always a risk, of course, whenever public opinion, which cannot be fully informed on any succession of events, is allowed to influence foreign policy. On the other hand, a democracy must allow it. You don't have a democracy if there is not some equation between public opinion and the resulting foreign policy. The State Department during this period of time was still relatively unprofessional, although it was becoming professionalized. At the time, the State Department had only 600 employees and an annual budget of $2 million. Foreign policy was not a vital concern of the Coolidge administration. 
French-American relations were at a low ebb. Since Briand's brash appeal to the American people, diplomatic channels had been all but closed. Then fate intervened. Charles A. Lindbergh's incredible flight across the Atlantic. The boyish hero captivated Paris. Spiritually starved Frenchmen and Americans were buoyed by the romance and chivalry of his flight. The young Galahad's return was reported on the new toy radio. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, Mr. Graham Mackenzie speaking from the Navy Yard, Washington, D.C. Awaiting Lindbergh. Lindbergh is coming down with the gang quest. Lindbergh's airplane diplomacy did more to improve French-American relations than years of State Department efforts. People of France and the people of Europe request that I bring back to the people of America one message. You have seen the affection of the people of France for the people of America. The goodwill lasted long enough for Kellogg to find a face-saving way to meet Brian's desire for a French-American treaty and to satisfy the harping cry of the American peace movement. In a rare stroke of genius, Kellogg proposed that all nations renounce war, and that became the kellogg brian Pact. Professor George Kennan. The kellogg brian Pact, the whole history of its negotiation was high comedy. It wasn't an act of deliberate policy on the part of the United States government. It was something into which the government was pushed by what you might call the sanctimonious lobby. There were very vigorous so-called peace lobbies at that time, which were full of emotion and very little discrimination. And they were extremely aggressive. And they did literally push the US government into negotiating and signing this utterly meaningless and rather silly agreement. It took one year to ratify the treaty. Finally, on July 24th, 1929, the kellogg Beyond Pact was complete. By now, there was a new president, Herbert Hoover, and he declared the anti-war treaty in effect at 1.22 p.m. Approval came only after Kellogg had assured the Senate that the treaty contained no sanctions and no obligations to come to the help of anybody. In spite of this, the kellogg Beyond Pact was hailed as a miracle and accolades rang throughout the world. Henceforth, justice and not violence was to reign in international affairs. What does war mean? I mean, it can have a hundred meanings. It can be a great war, it can be a small war, it can be a guerrilla war, it can be any form of violence that involves the forces of a state. Well, goodness knows in this world, uh, we have not come to that point of perfection where this sort of thing can be ruled out in all instances. And this was utterly unrealistic. The idea that you could just sign a pact and then there wouldn't be any more wars was childish. It was childish. Sophisticated people were cynical. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge called it absurd, yet he voted for it. Senator Hiram Johnson of California said he was not under the delusion that it would cure war. He also voted for it. Publisher William Randolph Hearst naturally opposed the treaty. He saw it as an entangling foreign alliance. Colonel Robert McCormick of the Chicago Tribune lamented that the United States was like Samson walking into the barber shop. If the press lords had looked over their shoulders, they would have known that they were being followed. Now this is a typical American living room in the 1920s, preserved by the Smithsonian Institution. And the most significant piece of furniture in this room is this radio. It was not yet providing much news and information, but it was wonderfully entertaining, and it was an escape from the confusions of the 1920s. 
Valentino's famous on the movie screen. And Mr. Heinz is known because of pork and beans. Don't think me and the boyfriend envy either one. They got dough, but oh, ain't we got fun. Collegiate, collegiate. The first broadcast by a radio station came in 1920 when KDKA of Pittsburgh broadcast the election returns to a local audience. It is now apparent that the Republican ticket of Harding and Coolidge is running well ahead of Cox and Roosevelt. At the present time, Harding has collected more than 16 million votes against some 9 million for the Democrats. We'll give you the state vote in just a moment. But first, we'd like to ask you to let us know if this broadcast is reaching you. Please drop us a card addressed station KDKA, East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Westinghouse dreamed up the idea to sell receivers. Radio news was a feeble influence in the early 1920s, as a young journalist named H.V. Kaltenborn found out in 1924. I was giving a series of current events talks in the auditorium of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Then along in the early 20s came radio, and I began broadcasting by delivering spoken editorials. This meant that my chief task was to present a point of view on each topic. In one of his news commentaries over WEAF in New York, Colton Bourne discussed American-Soviet relations. He criticized Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes for curtly rejecting Russia's bid for recognition. Hughes, a radio enthusiast, heard the broadcast at a dinner party and was so angry that he called the station and had Colton Bourne take it off the air. Hughes' successor, Frank Kellogg, would not be able to exercise the same power. The year the Kellogg Beyond Pact was signed, a man named David Sarnoff founded the first radio network, the National Broadcasting Company. A year later, when the treaty was ratified, a man named William Paley formed the Columbia Broadcasting System. The press lords had now been challenged. No longer would it be so easy to shut out the rest of the world. The voices of the world were becoming increasingly strident. The more we tried to ignore them, the more difficult that became. The development of radio simply would not permit it. Public opinion had become a consideration in formulating foreign policy. The Kellogg-Briand Pact to outlaw war was actually brought about by public opinion. It was a vocal and well-organized American peace movement that pushed diplomats into that naive and unrealistic treaty. Sometimes public opinion, as a scholar once noted, is only public and opinionated, not much more. In any case, foreign policy moved out of the hands of professionals and practical statesmen and into the hands of amateurs and idealists. The false security created by the kellogg Beyond Pact was buoyed by our sense of well-being and prosperity. Business was good, America was a land of plenty, and we were a self-sufficient nation. The absurdity of the concept that man could eliminate war by words alone demonstrates the crucial relationship between public opinion and foreign policy, and in a democracy, the life and death necessity of a well-informed public opinion.